Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. Good, good. Uh, well, um, I, my name is Allison Webb. I am a recovery ally. Uh, and for me, that means that I use my uh, skills, my talents, my resources, and my networks to support people in recovery. Uh, so if that sounds familiar, it's a whole lot like what we were just hearing earlier about how people in recovery might want to think about introducing themselves. So I'm going to talk today about uh, recovery allies in the community. Um, some of the material here is going to be familiar to you. Actually, I hope it's very familiar to you. And so um, I want you to sort of think about uh, hearing this presentation if, with, your, with a hat on as if you were an ally. And uh, so thinking about uh, allies in the community who might not know all that much about recovery or who might actually have some misinformation about recovery and addiction. Um, these are things that in my, in my view are some of the things that we need to be aware of when we talk with allies and when we recruit allies uh, to be a part of the recovery community. Um, one thing I'll also say is that I'm going to talk about people in the, rec in the community, so in the broader community, you can figure out what your community is, maybe it's a town, uh, maybe it's a county, um, some geographical space, uh, I'm not really talking about allies as family members, and it's not because it's not important, it's just that that's not what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm also a family member. Uh, I come from a family where there's substance use in all generations, uh, the two generations above me, my own generation, generation below me, at least only one generation below me now and my kids generation. Um, and I, um, I've been thinking about uh, what recovery has brought into my life. And um, in addition to uh, talking to lots of people in recovery and just hearing stories and connecting with people in such a wonderful way, um, I also have my brother back. And when I think about that, it really makes me very emotional because there was a long period of time where we were in touch, wasn't that we weren't in touch, uh, but it was really kind of hard to figure out like what was going on with him. And it went on for a very long period of time. And that's not the case any longer. Uh, he's very much in my life and he's very present. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I want to shout out to uh, Ron Springle, who's a friend of mine from Maine, uh, and a uh, shout out to my new colleagues from uh, Virginia. So uh, just expanding the recovery community, at least in my own life. Um, so how did I get here and why am I writing about recovery allies? So I, uh, as uh, the introducer mentioned, I work in public health, worked in public health in Maine uh, for over 30 years. Uh, if you don't know Maine, it's up in the right-hand corner of our country. It's exceedingly rural. Uh, we, have the, we have the distinction of being the least densely populated state east of the Mississippi, if that means anything to you. It means there's a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers, a lot of trees, uh, and not all that many people. Um, and so I spent my public health career there. And uh, one of the things that I did about, uh, probably about 12 years ago, uh, was I worked on a grant, this was a SAMHSA grant, to increase access to treatment for young people. Uh, so at that time, there was very little treatment for young people in Maine uh, for substance use disorder. And I'm sad to say that there's still very little treatment for young people in Maine, but we're working on it. Anyway, so I was working on this project. And one of the things that we thought we would do was we would, uh, we would recruit some interns, young people in recovery from the local university. Uh, they were actually involved in young people in recovery at the time, the organization young people in recovery. And we recruited them to go around the state and tell, tell their stories and combine that with panels, educational information about recovery, about addiction and recovery. And um, two things happened there. One was uh, the uh, young people would introduce themselves just wonderfully, my name is so-and-so, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And for me, that means they did it really well. And there were four of them. And after they would do their thing, I would stand up and I'd say, my name is Allison Webb, uh, and I work with these guys. And after about three public meetings like that, one of them pulled me aside and said, you know, Mrs. Webb, no offense intended, but that's really lame. You got to come up with something better. Uh, and so that's when I, be, and they helped me actually. We, we talked about it together. Like what, what, how would you introduce me? And so we came up with the, the ally thing. And I thought a lot about what that means to me. And sometimes actually the way I introduce myself changes a little bit depending on who I'm with. But the other thing that happened at those public meetings was without fail, 
someone would either say something uh, in the meeting itself or they would come up to me afterwards quietly. Allison, that's so interesting. It's so wonderful. How can I help? Okay, so these were librarians, they were neighbors, they were uh, yoga instructors, they were employers across the gambit. Uh, how can I help? And so that is really uh, the reason that I wrote the book because there's a, there's a need for an answer to that question. So again, putting on your, your ally hats, pretending you're allies. Uh, what we'll do today, talk about allies, talk about the recovery ecosystem. This should all be review, recovery capital, SAMHSA's pillars of recovery. I'll give you some real world examples, uh, but I want to be sure and spend some time for you all to, to think through your own uh, experience with allies and how you might recruit them and support them. So for right now, uh, recovery is process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, strive to reach their full potential. That's probably really familiar looking to you. It's SAMHSA's definition. There are lots of definitions of recovery. I'm happy to entertain any and all of them. I'm very open-minded in that regard. But if we're thinking about uh, our, our outward looking to allies, this is, a, this is as good as any in terms of a definition. And the things that often surprise allies are uh, that it's a process of change. Recovery is a process. Not everybody knows that. Uh, through which individuals improve health and wellness. Okay, so a lot of times, People think of recovery as sobriety, period, not the rest of the picture. So overall health and wellness, living a self-directed life, uh, we don't get to tell people in recovery what their path is. Again, not always obvious, not always obvious to people who are allies who just don't have, ex who wanna be allies, who don't have experience uh, with recovery and strive to reach their full potential. This is the place striving to reach their full potential where people who wanna be allies can actually really lock in because they play a role if they're an employer, if they're a teacher, uh, any kind of an educator, uh, if they're the code enforcement officer for crying out loud, there are lots of different ways where we as community members can help uh, every, we help each other reach our full potential in addition to people in recovery. And again, uh, for the purposes of today, recovery-friendly community, places, policies, people, and businesses open and welcoming to people in recovery. I picked this definition, there are others, but I picked this one because this is what allies can relate to. So a place, okay, so it's our town, or it's our church, or uh, it's some other sort of location. Uh, policies, everybody works on policies, whether they know it or not. You know, we, we elect people who then carry out the policies that we want them to carry out. I like to point to housing policies because that's one of the most obvious areas where um, there are issues for the recovery community. Uh, people, um, the people who are then allies, businesses again uh, this is something that allies can relate to very easily oh yeah like you got to go to work businesses can be recovery friendly um, so these are all the components um, of a recovery friendly community and who or what is an ally so it turns out that there's not a whole lot of research academic research on allies and so if there are academics in the audience uh, this was something that i would encourage you to take a look at um, because we do need to know more about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so uh, that's just a pitch, maybe a HRSA pitch also, if anybody wants to use this grant money to do that. Um, so a couple of definitions that I've run across. Uh, so the, the, uh, the collegiate recovery program, um, programs, plural, have done a lot of work actually with allies. It's one of the places where you can go to learn. Uh, there's ally trainings, there's ally materials. Typically those are allies who are on campus, so it's sort of limited in scope, but there's a lot of uh, material on allies. This is from a, a dissertation about a particular collegiate recovery program. They're just people who are passionate about people in recovery or the recovery world, and they wanna be a part of it. Keyword there is passionate. So a lot of times allies, like they are, like there's something about recovery that they get, they're not quite sure what, uh, they're pretty on fire about it, not sure why, uh, but looking for that passion uh, is important for a lot of allies. Uh, this is a little 
uh, more difficult to read. Allies are individuals who advocate for greater consumer involvement, but are not consumers. This is actually from a mental health uh, perspective. This definition suggests that allies are not members of the oppressed social group, but are members of dominant or majority social groups. We can think about that in a lot of different ways, um, and particularly when we think about oppressed group versus majority group. Uh, that's definitely how some allies will think about people in recovery. It's actually not how I think about people in recovery. Um, but uh, there is uh, this, in this, this definition, there's a distinction between people who are in recovery and people who are allies. And a lot of people I know who are in recovery identify themselves as allies also. So um, there you have that. Uh, this one actually is my favorite. Uh, it's a, from a friend of mine. An ally is someone who has come to us perhaps by accident and is comfortable in our tribe. So there's really no requirements there. You just get to feel comfortable among people in recovery. Um, and okay, I was gonna end with my favorite one, but um, so Tom Bennard, uh, who is with the Virginia uh, Commonwealth and VCU, Rams in Recovery, the collegiate recovery program there. Being an ally is about being continually willing to grow and to learn about people's experiences. Allyship is really personalized and individualized. The point here, which I think is really important is being willing to learn and grow as an ally. So you might as an ally show up and the only thing you know is what you've watched on TV about interventions and 12 step, that's all you know. Uh, okay, you can't be faulted for that. That's the way the media present it, but you can be encouraged to learn and grow about other recovery paths. Uh, okay, so got some different aspects of um, recovery allies. I thought I had, oh, never mind. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, if you think about yourselves as being a part of an organization, maybe it's a recovery uh, residence, maybe it's a treatment organization. Um, I'm thinking uh, here about recruiting allies, finding roles for allies. Um, why do people become allies? So training, care, and feeding, why do people become allies? First of all, it's like any other volunteer. It's because they're asked. And so I um, am a part of the Maine Association of Recovery Residences, and I would not have become a part of that if I hadn't been asked. Um, a very uh, thoughtful conversation about what the organization does, why it's important, why uh, someone appreciated the skills that I had, and asked. Uh, that's pretty, pretty straightforward sort of volunteer uh, management. Other part of volunteer management is acknowledging uh, and continuing to acknowledge and provide connection opportunities for those allies that are part of your organization. Sometimes when you're not in recovery and you're among people who are, uh, you know, it, it, it helps to have a little bit of an extra outreach for connection. And the other thing that I think is just really true is that allies, uh, you know, there may be something in it for them professionally. And I think we need to be very upfront about that. So if you're an employer and uh, you become re recovery friendly, either you get a special designation or not, but you become an ally in that regard, uh, you may be looked on well by your peers. You may uh, win some employees that you might not have gotten otherwise. Uh, just you may get some recognition in the community. So to, to be aware that there are things that, it, that allies can gain from also, and that's motivation. Um, allies are recovery carriers. And so we know that about the recovery community general, that generally that people in recovery are carriers for other individuals in recovery. But allies can be carriers as well when they talk about recovery in a positive way, when they connect with other people around recovery, when they're willing to say, I got my brother back and it was the most wonderful thing that's happened in a long time to me. That's really being a recovery carrier. And then the two areas where allies can act. Uh, one is their sphere of influence. Uh, and this, you know, you could be a little strategic if you've got your organizational hat on, be a little strategic about who you pick as allies. Uh, so the sphere of influence is where they work, where they live, where they, uh, where they worship. Um, and so where, where are those folks that you might like to have uh, 
to have access to. Um, and then social networks are who they hang out with uh, and who might you like to have access to through your allies. So um, I mentioned the collegiate recovery programs. Uh, there are many ally trainings available. They're online. Uh, there are lots of ally materials. Uh, so I picked this one um, partly because I just interviewed Tom and he's a great guy and it was a wonderful interview. I'm like, oh, I'm going to check him out online. Here he shows up. It's a pretty recent um, ally training <clears throat> that's available. Again, it's mostly for people who for students and faculty members on a college campus or university campus. But what I like about this training, it's kind of long, it's about an hour and a half, and talks about, um, I know we're not supposed to say addiction as a disease, but it talks about addiction as a disease. Uh, it, but as, you know, by way of education, it talks about adverse childhood experiences, it talks about why people use substances. I mean, it goes into a lot of information. And it also provides an opportunity for people who are participating to explore their own attitudes about substance use. And this is something that I think we, um, we may not spend as much time on as we should, which is um, as allies exploring our own attitudes. Um, we have biases, we have crappy experiences, we have all of those things that come along with uh, being in a community of people who or in active addiction and people who are in recovery. And so exploring that in our own lives, I think is actually particularly important. I'll share an experience from my own, this is from my own family, which is, uh, so we don't use the R word, which is recovery. Uh, we don't talk about the fact that there are members in my family who are in recovery. Uh, if we ever talk about uh, the period of time when people are using, we use those crappy words like drunk and, and addict. That's what we do in our family. And so it took me a long time to understand, number one, not every family does that. <laughs> and also not every family is silent about it. Many families talk about it, our family doesn't. So that was really helpful for me in terms of self-exploration to understand. Uh, and I learned a lot actually from talking to young people in particular, but others about their experiences in their family of uh, how it was with their mom or their sister or their brother or what have you, because we just never talk about that in my family for better, for worse, who we are. Um, so, okay, so now again, thinking about recovery allies and what is it that they need to know? Okay, so it might not occur to a recovery ally that there are these different parts of the recovery ecosystem. Again, we sort of know this or we're learning about it today. Um, individual level, okay? So that's often where people think that they're going to be uh, the ally where it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And that's often where family members are acting as allies. The community level, uh, again, thinking about your geography and what's in your community, uh, what services are available in your community. Um, again, people don't often think like, okay, I'm a lifeguard at a pool. What is it that I could possibly do as a recovery ally? There are all kinds of possibilities, but you need to kind of allow people to situate themselves. Where am I here? Um, at the institutional level, um, I think that this is critical uh, to have allies in institutions, in hospitals, uh, in uh, you name it, in any institution, educational institutions in particular, um, and employers as well. Uh, and then at the policy level, and I will say that a lot of people outside of the recovery community find uh, recovery advocacy really confusing uh, because there are multiple um, advocacy agendas within the advocacy community, within the recovery community. Uh, and, you know, some people are really nerdy about policy and other people like throw up their hands. But there are definitely, definitely allies um, at that policy level. Um, and then... Uh, just thinking about recovery capital, again, this is probably not news to you, but it is going to be for a lot of recovery allies. And so, you know, if you use that word, uh, you know, recovery capital or personal capital, they're going to automatically think, well, it's all about the person. It's all about the individual, right? It's just like whatever that person does or has, that's what recovery is, or that's what recovery capital is. And that's true. That's true. Whether a person has a self good self-esteem, has uh, the skills to manage his or her finances, um, has figured out how to get a job. Okay, that, that's what the characteristics of the individual, but 
um, and those are areas where we can help, right? As, as allies, we can support, but within the community, like we need to have our act together as a community to have treatment resources available, to have harm reduction available, um, to have added, this is where stigma comes in, which is a big role that, that allies can play uh, to deal with stigma. And then the social aspects of, um, of recovery capital, supportive relationships within the community, and not just the one-on-one, -on -one, but sort of organizations that provide support. I usually think about faith communities here where sometimes people in recovery have experienced a lot of pain uh, in uh, faith communities where they felt judged, um, but it's also a place where a lot of healing can take place. So we know SAMHSA's four pillars of uh, recovery. Allies might not know that. Um, and I think about these four pillars as a way of making really concrete <coughs> these aspects of recovery capital, recovery ecosystem. Okay, make it really concrete. People in recovery um, have a focus on their health. That's their mental health, their physical health, their spiritual health, their, their psychological health. And when you know that, uh, when you realize that, and, and maybe you're a counselor, or maybe you are a yoga instructor, whatever your role is, you can, you can understand health, right? Health and wellness. Maybe you're a, a um, phys ed instructor. Home, same thing with home. Okay, housing, we all know, is so incredibly critical for people in, uh, particularly in early recovery. And uh, when you say house or when you say home, okay, an ally gets it. Like, yeah, okay, so what does that mean in my community? Where are, are there, what is a recovery house? Are there recovery houses? What access do people have to housing if they don't want a recovery house? What, what does NIMBY look like in my community? So those are really concrete ways that allies can like connect um, to housing um, purpose, education, employment. We know that again, really important ways where allies can connect. And I think here, particularly about employment and education. So um, there are these initiatives around the country for recovery friendly employers. Um, they look a little bit different in each area, but mostly it's a designation that uh, you're an employer who has done some work in educating yourself and educating your workforce about addiction, about recovery, and about resources in the area. That's just incredibly important for people who are seeking, uh, seeking employment, for example. And the pillar of the uh, fourth pillar of community, usually this means uh, peer support and peer uh, recovery centers, um, which are incredibly important and important for us as allies to really get it, that there is a community of peers that's important for a lot of people in recovery. And I would challenge the recovery community to think a little bit bigger than that. Uh, so this pillar, it's usually meant to be peer support. I really feel like that pillar should be the broader community. Um, because when you, um, when you put the, the parameters around peer support, you're excluding your allies and they can actually be very important in building community. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples. Um, how are we doing for time? Um, what time is it? Uh, 10.56. Oh, great, got good, good. oodles of time. Um, I'm gonna give some examples now. Um, I uh, write for a magazine called Journey Magazine. Uh, that is a print magazine that's also available online. It's print because it shows up in jails and prisons in New England uh, and in treatment facilities where people don't have access to, um, to the internet. And uh, I do an ally column, uh, which is a lot of fun because I get to interview a lot of people who are allies who have taken very different paths to being allies. They have different reasons for it, different motivations. So I thought I would give you some examples. So Maine is very, as I said, it's very rural. Um, our resources are limited. Um, and still, uh, we have people that step up in their own ways. And so if you think you live in a town where you've got nothing, uh, I'm sorry, that's not true. Uh, there's always something there. And if you think about, um, you know, this phrase, the op opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Sometimes in my experience, um, the ability that we have when we live in small towns, or maybe your state is like Maine, Maine is one small town because everybody knows each other. Um, what we have, the ability that we have in small towns is so powerful for connection 
compared to some other, for example, urban areas. So I would encourage you to think about the assets that you have uh, in your rural areas and not the deficits. So I'm gonna just go through some of these examples. Um, so it's hard to see this, but these are people who are um, in praise in a church. Uh, we had a church um, in a wealthy community in Maine, uh, an Episcopal church uh, that was one of those been in the community forever kinds of churches that um, realized that there was a problem. There was an overdose problem in their community that people were finally talking about. And uh, they uh, had a stewardship committee and they tried to figure out, well, what, what can we do? I mean, and they understood that their role in the community in the past had often been as an educator. As an educator. Um, and so they held a series of um, seminars. One was on what is addiction and recovery. Uh, one was on harm reduction. I believe they did a naloxone training, which at that time was blew my mind. Uh, Ron did a housing, uh, one on recovery housing, and that happened at a time when there was some NIMBY activity in a house that, uh, in that same community. Uh, and they did one other one, maybe on peer support. So this, this, was, this came from the church. It came from the community. It was community members that attended. Uh, and they incorporated the recovery community. They reached out to the recovery community and said, can you help us with this? Like, what should we be doing? Okay, again, hard to see, but this is a woman who's doing yoga. Um, so there is a woman, uh, two women that I interviewed actually, again, from, you know, from Maine, um, who are yoga instructors. Uh, one of them is in recovery herself, and she uh, leads a recovery, uh, a recovery yoga session um, at the recovery community center. It's trauma informed. Um, and it is, um, you know, it's slow. It's quiet. No hands on very, very careful and gentle for people who've experienced trauma in their lives. Um, and the other woman that I interviewed uh, had a slightly different approach. She went to a studio that was one of these, you know, pay what you can studios. Uh, and she did a 12 step yoga program. So the yoga program start the yoga session started with, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of, of AA and then followed that with a yoga session. Uh, okay. So this is a baker. It's a little bit hard to tell, but we have, uh, so Maine is known for its potatoes. Uh, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> Got to be known for something, right? Um, and so uh, we have a gentleman in the state who started making donuts out of potato flour. Uh, it's kind of a gimmick, but it's also potato flour. I mean, you can make things out of potato flour. So he makes these donuts uh, and his business is called the Holy Donut. And he, H-O-L-Y, uh, he um, started the business. He uh, is, is an employer. I think he's, I don't know if you've got six retail locations. He's got the bakery, obviously. And he began to realize that many of the people that he was, he was hiring were in recovery. So he, he's identified uh, across the state as a recovery friendly employer. And he says, you know, I didn't like set out to be recovery friendly or be an ally or anything like that. I just wanted to be a good employer. And when I found out my employees were in recovery, you know, I realized that this was something that I needed to learn about and needed to, to support. Uh, so, um, I have a friend that I interviewed who's a photographer. Uh, she has, um, some trauma in her own life and she, uh, finds it incredibly healing herself to take photos of individuals who are, uh, in recovery or seeking recovery. Um, many are on the streets. And so she, uh, really has made it, um, it's a mission of hers really to see people who are in recovery, like really see them. Uh, and when you talk to photographers, you realize like when they're behind the lens, like there's something going on there. They, they sense, okay, I see the person that's in front of me and that's really important to her. I'm going to skip that for last law enforcement. We were just talking about law enforcement. Uh, so in Maine, there are a couple of police departments where, uh, you can, um, <clears throat> take your, uh, drugs, if you have drugs, take your paraphernalia, turn them in, uh, no questions asked. Uh, and you, if you're, if you're willing, uh, that's the whole reason you would turn your stuff in and they will hook you up with treatment. And so 
these are, you know, very small police departments in small towns where you might not expect cops to be recovery friendly, but they are. Um, and uh, so, you know, I put family members here. Mostly I'm thinking about grandparents in this particular photo. I've just interviewed so many grandparents who are taking care of their grandchildren um, because of the circumstances of their kids. And they, um, they, they warm your heart in one way, they break your heart in another way, but they are very strong allies because of their emotional connection that they have to their children and their grandchildren. Uh, so this is a banjo, my husband's a banjo player, but actually uh, the reason I put it here was perhaps you, you all are more familiar with this uh, employer in Kentucky who is a loot maker, luthier, uh, who hires people coming out of prison or jail to make wooden instruments. Uh, and so again, it, it, it became a passion of the luthier, of the owner of the business when he realized uh, there was a need for him. He had a need for employees. There was a need for people to have employment, but also, you know, there's something about woodworking and working with your hands that can be healing for a lot of people. And then the, the knitting. Okay. So um, I want to get this quote, right? So anybody familiar with the work of David Best? Okay. So this is a quote from David Best. Uh, he was, this was when he was, I think he was doing a presentation to NAR uh, last year. And he said, look at community resources, not reimbursable services. So remember I said, every community has some, has some assets. Start with people power and whatever assets are available. You can start with a knitting club and grow from there. So, you know, maybe there aren't knitting clubs in your town, but maybe there are. Um, but to think about where you have people who are connecting with each other and see where that grows in terms of being an ally. So now you guys get to do some work. So uh, what I would like to do, uh, there should be, um, there's probably not enough of these to go around. So you might need to work in pairs or teams. Um, so has anybody like developed an action plan, done like action planning for either health education or public health or? Okay, drawing blanks. Okay, well, anyway. So uh, an action plan is something that um, you set up for yourself. And there is some evidence, in fact, oops, let me do that. There is some evidence that when you attend a conference and you sit there and you listen and maybe even participate, but there is some evidence that if you create an action plan for yourself that's pretty specific and you put it in your pocket and you take it home, that you know, there's a pretty good chance that you might actually follow through on that. So I thought we might just give that a try uh, right now. So the idea here is think about what you've learned here and what you know generally anyway about uh, recovery capital, what you know about your community and think about um, some smart objectives, right? So again, if, you, if you're in public health, smart is all over the place. So you wanna be very specific about your, your action you want to have your action be measurable and achievable, right? You don't want to uh, recruit the entire uh, Tabernacle Choir as allies. That's not a smart objective. Um, you want to be realistic and time bound. Okay, so if you're an ally, you can think about um, what your own sphere of influence is, where your talents are, uh, and take a, think about a concrete action that you can take in the next 30 days. And I'm gonna share one with you that I did like a week and a half ago. I still haven't followed through on it, but I got another 15 days. Um, so my action step was <clears throat> by June 30th, I will contact the addiction and recovery center in my town <clears throat> and set up an appointment for a visit and meeting. So I wanna meet people in my town. I just haven't done it yet. <clears throat> so I'm gonna read it again. By June 30th, so it's time bound. I will contact the addiction and recovery center in my town. So it's pretty specific. It's also measurable if I do it or I don't do it. Uh, and I'm gonna set up an appointment for a visit and a meeting. It's also pretty achievable. I'm pretty sure I can do that. Um, and it's realistic. So take some time. And if you're in recovery or if you're in a recovery organization, maybe think about how you might like to identify allies uh, and bring them into the work that you do. So there's a space here. Um, at the bottom, I'll give this back to you guys. I don't know if you can bring it together. Um, 
to, to do that. And then what we'll do, we'll come back and I don't know what, how much our time we have, but we'll come back and we'll share um, our action plans and we'll also have time for question and answer. So any questions about the action plan? Okay, I'm gonna bring you back, bring you back here. I hope everybody's talking about their action plans. I'm sure that's what all the chatter is about. Uh, <laughs> so I wonder uh, if anyone would like to uh, share, uh, share their action plan. So first of all, awesome action plan. Um, I'll see if I can repeat it. So by July 9th, I will connect with an organization um, to talk about recovery allies in your community. I didn't get quite the details, but she's got all the detail around it. So who, what, when, where, um, and uh, that's awesome. That's great. Do you have any, any thoughts in your own mind about who allies might be? Right. So I'll just repeat that in case people didn't hear. So uh, the possible um, allies she identified were employers and then also people involved in housing uh, because of the barriers that we know about around housing with people who have felony convictions and so forth. Thank you. Who else? Yeah. So mine's really kind of a short an ally that has fallen through the cracks and really needs to make people I'll reach out and set up a meeting to discuss the plan. You know, some monitors, specific workshops that we want to do. The, the who is this businessman? The what is what residents for our transitional residents? This is a local business and it's on the list of church as well. And when uh, first week of July 27th. <laughs> So, so by a date in July, you're going to reach out to some specific individuals that you already know about some trainings that have just sort of not happened, but it's time to make them happen. Right, we've had a history that's fallen through the cracks, and I know that this has been something that's been so it's been really Cool. Oh, I hope this like jump starts that again. Yeah. Others. Yeah. around the city that we live in because there's some really tiny uh, communities that have no um, outreach going to them, you know, just really, really small places. So I'm going to sit down with my staff and come up with some ideas for reaching out to some, some groups, identifying who they are, and figuring out uh, how to get in touch with them. So the action plan is actually sitting down with your staff right. to identify opportunities in those surrounding communities. Cool. Excellent. Others? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm actually looking to utilize the uh, networking contacts that we make here for so uh this event has been such a wonderful for so many people uh do and go to especially in the rural medical areas that the gentleman just mentioned, uh the project that we have right now, the budget plan, uh it's really correlates to everything that we do here. So my action plan is by the thirtieth to uh, make contact with every single networking opportunity that I've made here to so that we uh, create some type of active collaboration with the new infrastructure program that we have now, or we are trying to establish uh, resources and materials and training for rural groups that may not have those opportunities available to them now, or creating some type of collaboration, whether that be just through uh, referrals, references, or uh, contacts in the uh, advertising market and the media uh, before the end of October. So we get these funds for the end of the year, making sure that everything is funded. Yeah, 
That's amazing. So first of all, I want to steal that, which is by, I can't remember what the date was, by June 30th, I'll make contact with everybody, you know, that's, that's here. I think that's amazing. We should all be doing that. Um, but then with a specific intent to utilize the resources of individuals who are here to develop some collaborations and programs and so forth. Oh, wow. With two deadlines. That's great. Nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. Show me recovery where we um, showcase people's recovery stories every week. We do something new, but I don't understand that the allies want to be. So, if you have a website, so I know like how complicated it can be to actually get a website changed. So, is there like by the end of September you're going to add oh, that? Yeah, they'll add that content. Okay, okay, okay. Good for you. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And I can say, you know, from my own experience um, as an ally, like when you're new to it, you don't know, like, you don't know, like, could I do that? Would that be helpful? Well, I don't know. And so when you hear stories of other people, and I would say particularly stories of other people who aren't necessarily family members, um, that, uh, you know, like we had, a, I was serious about a librarian who, um, you know, she set up a particular uh, program in the library around use of computers. That's all it was. Uh, it was a small library in town, um, but she made it, she made, she did outreach to the recovery community to make sure that people knew about it. So uh, not something that I would have thought about, you know, people just don't know, just don't know. Okay, good. I'll check out your website. <laughs> And that's, that's right. That's right. July 1st. I'll put it on my calendar. Others. Others. Yeah. Um, so I made the um, action plan that by June 30th, I would connect with and invite myself to um, what is our interfaith Christian leadership group. It's all of the non denominational it's all the non-denominational churches in our area from Idaho. Um, and the leaders get together and I will offer them education or whatever and then see what follow up after that. Uh-huh. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Do we do we have any online questions or how would you okay? Okay. Okay, great. So now's the uh, time for questions, and we will take some <coughs> online questions if uh, any come in, uh, and we'd certainly encourage that. But uh, now we can um, ask some general questions or talk about uh, plans or uh, anything you'd like, and we will great. be uh, repeating the questions yeah. as yeah. well, which is uh, great. great. Anybody got a question? Yes, back there. Um, to your point earlier about um, collaborating with other recovery organizations and recovery organizations, what's your experience been with uh, connecting different types of recovery organizations that come from very different uh, standpoints or, or, or value systems? Have you found that um, I've found that experience to, to either um, be more beneficial when they are you know, very uh, different? Do you want to repeat the question? Or you want me to repeat it? Oh, I, I, I can okay. try and summarize. Yeah. It. Uh, so, um, so as we know, there's a lot of different trends in recovery and different uh, viewpoints, especially the faith-based versus the not faith-based and the 12-step versus the not 12-step. So uh, how do we, how do we relate? What should we know and what, what should we expect when we talk to someone who's sort of outside of our usual orbit? Is that is that what you meant? <laughs> um, so I think it's impossible to work in the recovery space without having the experience of uh, you know people whose pathways are not the same and who have different value systems. To phrase it in a very friendly way. Um, oftentimes that's a combative situation. And certainly uh, I have been involved in organizations where that's been the case. 
Um, and what I can say is that, um, you know, I think it's our job. Uh, it's actually a little easier as an ally than as a person in recovery, but it's our job, our collective job to um, talk about all pathways. Uh, and so that people have knowledge about them. So I think sometimes uh, you might you might be surprised, but I talk I talk to lots of people in recovery, and they don't know about other pathways. They know about their own pathway, and that's what was so important to them. And so you never want to take that away, of course. But a, ed, education can go a long ways towards uh, towards what you're talking about, which is maybe you know you may not get you may not get organizations to work together they may not have to work together but at least understand each other and if they do have to work together you know you know finding a way to lay out some ground rules about respect and and um and honesty but yeah it, I, I think that i think that um that issue is not going to go away uh and the longer we shy away from it the more entrenched it gets yeah yes uh, John Lee, uh, Allison, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just want to add to what your response is. We have had at the recovery effort the success. Uh, we had it as an organizing principle to welcome the harm reduction. Very strong in search areas. And the absent based recovery was under the same path. Until, until we had that uh, the application of that in order to put a measure of recovery as a Now they can have a conversation mm -hmm. about what what is true for everyone, regardless of what your pathway to recovery is, and how motivated you are, and what your specific motivations are uh, as a caregiver or as a advocate or ally. Um, what we know is that people are very resentful when they take their strengths. So I'm going to just repeat that, particularly for people um, online, because I think that's super important. So uh, thank you, John. Um, so uh, John was suggesting that using the, the notion of recovery capital as the organizer for your conversations across different pathways, um, particularly when harm reduction is involved, but certainly lots of other disagreements out there in the recovery community. But when we're talking about recovery capital and the importance of building it, uh, that's a that's a unifying principle that that I would be surprised if we couldn't get if we couldn't all get behind that. Yeah, cool. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Allison, thanks. This was great. Uh, mm -hmm. We use a hundred more times. Oh, thank you. We'll be down in September when your book comes out. <laughs> thank uh, you. And uh, uh, I, I've had the privilege of reading the manuscript, um, and uh, it is it is so rich and full of ter terrific information and research. And I was just talking to Logan here about it, and as I was speaking, he ordered two copies. Oh, thank you. I mean, thank you, Logan. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend that uh, someone's really new, either new recovery or just new to wanting to help. Um, what can they do uh, to identify others in their community uh, without like going around saying, hey, would you like to be a recovery ally? Um, what, what kind of uh, places where you look or things you might say to, to help to uh, sort of you know, develop a group, a uh, mm -hmm. recovery support group? For, of, of allies? Wow, that's a really good question. So obviously it depends on the resources in your community. Um, so if you have a recovery community center, like go there. Um, I would also say um, that this may sound a little odd, Ron, but um, when those of us who are not in recovery go to 12-step meetings, 
first of all, we learn a lot. Um, uh, we are humbled, uh, we are inspired, and we meet people. Um, and so, yeah, we're meeting people in recovery, but we're also, once you do that, you're meeting their family members and you're meeting their neighbors and you're meeting others. Uh, so I would uh, recommend that even if that's not a way to build community, it's a way to learn. Um, and then, um, you know, I think the other place where I've seen connections happen like that, I guess the two other places I've seen connections happen like that. One is in those community meetings about addiction, where people show up with very different levels of knowledge about addiction and recovery. Um, and they learn, uh, you know, everybody takes away something different from those places, but they're typically uh, in that room are people who already know each other. And now they know, oh, wait, so you're here. What's interesting about this for you? So that's another way to do it. And then um, at least uh, in Maine, and I don't know if this is happening elsewhere, but there are a lot of, uh, re there are a lot, there are some uh, presentations on uh, harm reduction, overdose prevention, uh, and some on addiction and recovery to business groups, right? So chambers of commerce, um, which again, it's another place to just connect with people uh, and very lightly kind of say, oh, what's your interest in this? Like, you guys doing anything on that? And so those are the things that come to mind right off the top of my head. Okay, well, I think uh, we have time for maybe one last question or, yes. My name is Ray for how do you empower the allies in such a way of, Training them up for boundaries, and especially if somebody that comes from the outside who doesn't know. I don't know me personally, I can be a very manipulative person, especially in my addiction. Um, you know, I get, get things I want. How do you want to power? How do you try to work with allies that don't? So that is an awesome question. I think it's probably a pretty good way to end. Uh, so the question was, how do we uh, empower allies, but also train them um, to be appropriate, for lack of a better word? Um, so I think that you will find uh, that the, the ally training that I showed you, but there again, there are others, there are plenty of them online, um, does enough education about uh, substance use disorder. Sometimes there's even education about different substances. Uh, and um, about uh, the experiences of people who are using substances. So there's enough in there to um, maybe contain some of, of, of an ally's um, impulse to solve somebody else's problem right away. Um, so I think training is incredibly important, but I also think that um, actually one of the ally trainings that I've been a part of includes motivational interviewing, like just just describing like, here's a good way to have a conversation, okay? Um, but I will also say that having been like in this space for, I don't know how many years now, 12, 15, it's a matter of time, you know? I mean, I don't think it's fair to expect uh, somebody right off, the, uh, right off the bat to understand all of the things that you understand having lived with your, in your situation for so long. And so I would say also, uh, that it's incumbent upon those of you who are in recovery and those of us who've been around a while as allies to to gently educate. Yeah, it's a very good question. Gently educate is a very good one to end on too. Uh, and, and gentleness is uh, very important here. Uh, but thank you, Allison, thank you. for a great uh, presentation. Great, thanks. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>